Yeah, I've actually written uh, a small book about the Star of Bethlehem, uh, you can see here. And it's a good time of year to uh, think about th this amazing intervention of God into the world uh, with the Star of Bethlehem. Just to mention why I'm particularly interested in this topic, I've got a background in designing spacecraft for the European Space Agency. Uh, and many of the spacecraft I've designed actually operate in low Earth orbit. And I've often wondered if the Star of Bethlehem was in the low Earth orbit. So this is one of the reasons I'm interested in this particular uh, topic. In 1989, I worked a little bit on the Skylark rocket. In 1990, I worked a little bit on the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which of course is very much related to uh, astronomy. And that certainly uh, increased my in interest in astronomy, uh, but also worked on several Earth observation satellites that you can see there. But anyway, that's that's where my own particular interest in the Star of Bethlehem comes from. But right at the beginning, I thought it would be helpful just to go through the reading from Matthew 2, which gives us this uh, incredible account of the Star of Bethlehem and the wise men. and. As I read this, just listen out for some of the really interesting details of the account. And also remember that this is real history. It's, it's not just a story, it's actually real recorded history. And listen out for details. Uh, for example, notice how Herod uh, gets from the wise men when they saw the star so that he could work out how old the baby Jesus was when the wise men were visiting. So just pick out that particular detail from this account. So reading from the beginning of Matthew 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. When you have found him, bring him word to me, bring word to me, that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So there we read that uh, incredible historical uh, account of an amazing miracle at the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus. Now there'll be two parts uh, to this presentation and the first one is a Q&A. Often a Q&A goes at the end of a talk 
but uh, in some ways it's useful to have this right at the beginning because that uh, account of the Star of Bethlehem does raise a number of questions. So in the first part, we'll uh, seek to answer some of those questions. And then in the second part, we'll look at some spiritual lessons from this account. So we will look at these questions. Was the star supernatural or was it a natural event? How did the wise men recognize it? Where did the wise men come from? How many wise men were there? How long did it take to reach Bethlehem? Why did they go to Jerusalem first? And how old was Jesus when the wise men visited? No doubt you've already started to get Christmas cards this Christmas and uh, probably some of them will show the wise men visiting the manger to the baby Jesus and we'll be looking if that is an accurate uh, fact or not. So th these various qu questions uh, are raised when reading that uh, account. So we'll seek to go through these at the beginning of this talk. So firstly, was the star of Bethlehem a supernatural star or was it a natural event like a planetary alignment? Now, I firmly uh, take the view that the star of Bethlehem was a supernatural uh, event. I think most of the reformed commentators also take that view uh, and I'll explain why. Firstly, the star moved like no other kind of star because we read in verse 9 and behold the star, the star of Bethlehem went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now stars do not do that kind of moving. In fact, uh, stars are very predictable in the way they rise in the east and they set in the west. Um, and yet the star of Bethlehem didn't do that. It had this very special movement. So that, that's the main reason that I believe that the star of Bethlehem was a supernatural uh, star. It's really, it, it's amazing how God uh, could do that to lead the wise men to where the young child was. But there are some other reasons. The wise men recognized the star of Bethlehem as being very special in those first verses of Matthew 2, they said, we have seen his star in the east. It's hard to think they would say that if they were looking at a planetary alignment. But thirdly, Babylonian astronomers or people from the east uh, were very good at astronomy. It's believed that they understood what a comet was. They would have understood what a planetary alignment was. Uh, so had planets like Venus, um, uh, maybe Jupiter, some bright stars were aligned, the astronomers would have known that. And so uh, that sign wouldn't have made such an impression with them had it have just been a planetary alignment. And we can also say God did not need to rely on a natural event like a planetary alignment. God has created the stars of the entire universe he spoke them into existence. God didn't need a natural uh, event. And following on from that, the birth of the Lord Jesus was marked by several great miracles. The first Christmas time was a, was a time of miracles. There was the virgin birth, conception. Uh, there was Zechariah losing his voice, an angel visiting Mary, an angel visiting the shepherds, angel visiting Joseph, uh, which we also read about again in that uh, reading from Matthew 2. And so it's entirely in line with that first uh, Christmas event and with the character of God that the star of Bethlehem would have been a supernatural uh, phenomenon. It's worth pointing out that uh, there was a previously uh, an incredible miracle in the heavens when the sun stood still for Joshua. We read about this in Joshua chapter 10. There was a battle and, and we read, then Joshua said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajelo. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Again, showing God is so powerful. He can easily create stars, stop the sun, um, and again, this ties in with a supernatural interpretation 
of the Star of Bethlehem. But then we move on to the second question. How did the wise men recognize the star as being uh, the star of Bethlehem, his star, the Savior's star? Well, God could have spoken directly to the hearts of those, those wise men. Uh, that's perfectly possible. Um, here, we're just to remind you how the verse says, uh, the wise men, notice how bold they are in this verse. Uh, we have seen his star in the east. That was a very bold statement. There's no doubting in that statement. And, and also the wise men would have known that Herod could be made angry or worried. Uh, and yet the wise men were very bold in their witness in Jerusalem to the king. So how did those wise men recognize the star? Well, as I say, it could have been God speaking to their hearts. But they may have known about this prophecy from the book of Numbers from the Old Testament. Uh, in Numbers 24, we read that a star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Now, a scepter relates to royalty. And so this verse indicates that royalty shall come out of Jacob and a, a star will be uh, a sign. It's a, a prophecy of Balaam. Now. If the wise men came from the east, from uh, Babylonia, how would they have known about this verse? Well, they could have well known about this verse because Daniel in the Old Testament had previously taught wise men in Babylonia, uh, in Susa. Uh, and in the Babylonians were very good at passing on knowledge from one generation to another. So it's perfectly possible that the wise men at the time of Jesus knew of this verse, this prophecy from the Old Testament. And it's, it's rather uh, amazing to think these wise men looking up at a starry sky, when they saw the star of Bethlehem, they may have brought to mind this verse and had that incredible insight and uh, great joy in not just seeing a very special sign in the sky, but actually understanding the amazing significance of that special sign in the sky. Uh, just, just relating to that, uh, we, we can ask the question, where was the star when the wise men first saw it? It's quite an interesting question that some people ask. Now they had this statement, for we have seen his star in the east. Now that statement is not totally clear because it can mean one of two things. Firstly, it can mean when the wise men were in the east, then they saw the star and they would have seen the star in the western sky. Or it could mean we saw the star and the star was in the eastern sky. Now I take the first of these options that they were saying when they were in the east, that's when they saw the star. And the, the reason I take the verse that way is that uh, if they were in Babylonia and the star was over the Lord Jesus in, in Bethlehem, then they would have seen uh, the star in the western sky, not the eastern uh, sky, as you can see on the map there. Now, we can't be dogmatic because the verse is not clear, but I take it that they're saying that they saw the star when they were in the east because the wise men were from the east. But then we have the question, where did the wise men come from? Well, we can't be dogmatic, but it's somewhere in the east. It could well have been in Babylonia. In Babylonia, uh, it was a place where wise men did come from. Astronomers came from there. Uh, there was a lot of learning in Babylonia. Uh, it's where Daniel was. The wise men could have come from a place like Susa. In Daniel chapter 8, in the first two verses, um, uh, in fact, in verse 2, we read of the citadel of Susa, where Daniel had uh, connections. And so it's possible that they came from somewhere like Susa in Babylonia. Uh, in many places in Babylonia, like Susa, are around uh, 1,500 kilometers 
away. So the wise men may have come a very significant uh, distance uh, in order to get to Jerusalem and later to Bethlehem. We can't be dogmatic, but th th here are some ideas. Then we come to a very common uh, question, which is well, how many wise men were there? Because if you've had your Christmas cards, uh, they will, in most cases, uh, say that there were three wise men. While well, we cannot be dogmatic and we do not know uh, for sure, there could have been more than three wise men. It is quite possible that there were three wise men. There were three uh, gifts. Um, so it's quite possible there were three wise men. They may have had helpers and servants. Um, so, so, so we don't know how many there were, but it, it could have been three. And, and we don't know how they traveled, but traveling by camel on a long journey would have been quite a common means of traveling. Here's an interesting question. How long did it take to reach Bethlehem? And this also ties in with uh, another question, which is how old would Jesus have been when they actually got to Bethlehem? Well, it would have taken really quite a long time to get from Babylonia or the east to Bethlehem. Uh, it was a very difficult journey. They didn't have motorways and service stations. Uh, it would have been a long journey. And it wasn't just the time it would take on the journey. There's also the issue of how long it would prepare, uh, how long it would take to prepare for the journey. Uh, you can't just uh, drop everything and go on this long journey. They may have had to sort out some business before leaving to prepare all the camels. Uh, it was going to be a long, dangerous journey. So there would have been a lot of preparation involved and it could have been months of preparation and then months of uh, traveling. So it could easily take uh, the, the order of a year to, to travel to, to Bethlehem. The idea that it would be a really short journey and they would get to the manger and baby Jesus would still be a baby. Uh, that's that's hard to that's hard to justify. So then we get to the really one of the really interesting questions. How old was Jesus when the wise men uh, came and visited him? Uh, many Christmas cards have a baby Jesus in the manger. And actually, you can have artistic license. So I don't want to condemn Christmas cards that have the wise men lining up behind the shepherds to see baby Jesus. But strictly speaking, uh, Jesus is much more likely to have been a toddler, what may be one year old or one and a half years old when the wise men actually uh, saw him. So this would be a more realistic picture here. Now, why do I say that? Well, let's go back to those verses that we read earlier and two particular verses, seven and 16. Notice in verse seven how Herod uh, determines from the wise men uh, when the star appeared. Uh, he secretly called the wise men. Maybe he wanted to do a secret calculation. He didn't want everyone to know how old Jesus was, but he wanted to know. So he asked them what time the star appeared. Then notice in verse 16, uh, he killed the children from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So that calculation of two years old was based on the calculation of how old Jesus was at the time he did his murderous uh, uh, campaign. Now, that's not to say that the calculation said Jesus was two. He may have calculated that Jesus was one, but he wanted to apply a safety factor because people wouldn't know exactly how old these young uh, boys were. So Jesus could have been one or it could have been one and a half. But this clearly came from a calculation of uh, Herod. And on top of that reasoning, we also have another verse in verse 11 where it says, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary. Now notice it says when they had come into the house, not the manger. And notice how it says they saw the young child, not the young baby with Mary. So those things seem to confirm there was a meeting uh, a long time after 
the manger and the shepherd. So the wise men probably never met those uh, shepherds. So it is an interesting question. We can't be dogmatic, but the verses do seem to indicate that Jesus would have been a young toddler rather than um, a baby. And here's another really interesting question. Why did the wise men go to Jerusalem? Why didn't the star lead them straight to Bethlehem? Well, first of all, uh, the verses indicate that the star may not have been leading them the entire time. Uh, in the verses, we do read when the, 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 the wise men said the star they had seen previously reappeared and led them to Bethlehem. So the star had stopped shining. So what may have happened is that the wise men were initially led to Israel and they first went to Jerusalem. So why did they go to Jerusalem? Well, from a spiritual point of view, God wanted them obviously to witness at the capital of Israel. But practically, either the star led them to Jerusalem or Jeruz Jerusalem was a natural target. It was the capital of Israel. Now, from the east, when, if, when they were in Babylonia or the east, they almost certainly could not differentiate between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. When they first saw the star, uh, the star over Israel, Israel was so far away from the east that, that they wouldn't have been able to say, well, the star looks to be over Bethlehem, not over Jerusalem. It would, there would have been no difference between Jerusalem and Bethlehem because Jerusalem and Bethlehem are not far away um, from each other, especially if you're looking from as far away uh, as, as Babylonia. And this is the verse I was referring to just now. When they got to Jerusalem, the star uh, was probably no longer visible because in verse nine, it says the star that they had previously seen. So only after uh, visiting Jerusalem did the star reappear and then lead them from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem. But the most important thing is that God wanted them to witness at Jerusalem. And as I said before, there was that wonderful bold witness of the wise men in Jerusalem. So then we come to part two, the spiritual lessons. And this is the most important uh, part because there are many uh, spiritual lessons. I think I have 10 points here. The first point, it shows that God is powerful. We live in a world that doubts if God exists or if he does exist, he's not powerful or he's distant. But this account shows that God is not a distant God and he is a powerful God. Only God can make a supernatural star. Only God can make a star stop over a house. Only God can cause a virgin birth and only God can provide salvation to needy sinners such as you and I. And so looking at this, uh, the story of the, the true story of the star of Bethlehem, it should encourage us, firstly, that God is powerful. Secondly, it can encourage us that God loves mankind because it shows that God is not a distant God, but God is an intervening God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The star of Bethlehem shows that God does intervene in the world in real time in, and in space. And God also intervenes in the way he wants to speak to mankind. Right in Genesis 1, uh, we read those words, let there be lights in the firmament. Let them be for signs and seasons. Notice signs. God wants to send signs in the heaven. Uh, to wake man up, uh, to tell man that there is a God in heaven. And the star of Bethlehem, uh, the most important star sign there's ever been. Then in the Old Testament, God speaks to us with many prophecies about the coming 
uh, saviour, one of the most famous prophecies coming from Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name will be called Wonderful and Mighty God. Just one more prophecy to mention from, from Micah, mentioning Bethlehem. Uh, before many years before Jesus was born, Bethlehem was prophesied to be the birthplace of the coming ruler of Israel. So God, he speaks to mankind. And that's not surprising because if God has created the world, created man, it's not surprising that he's left a testimony. He's left his word for us uh, to read. God doesn't force us to listen to him, but God has, has spoken to us, particularly through his word. And he wants us to listen. And for those who have ears, they can hear uh, the message from God and the message of the gospel. Now, it's also important to realise that uh, the, the, the account of the Star of Bethlehem, it not only shows that God is real, but it also shows that Satan is real and active. Uh, it's good that we focus on the good news uh, that comes out of the whole accounts of Christmas, the star of Bethlehem. But it's also important to see how there is also this lesson that Satan is real and active. In that account, we read these words. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. It's really remarkable that the spiritual leaders in Jerusalem, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, their priority was to be loyal to Herod. They were also troubled. They should have been overjoyed at the idea of the coming Messiah, the coming king. And yet Satan stirred up Herod to uh, be worried, to hate the coming king. He stirred up even the religious leaders to be loyal to Herod. So Satan is very real and active. And in a way, it's not surprising because Satan was obviously worried at the time of that first Christmas that his kingdom was under threat. Uh, Satan's kingdom, in a way, had this very obvious invasion uh, from above when Jesus came into the world. And so it's not surprising he was particularly active at that time that Jesus came into the world. And then when Herod did that terrible act, putting to death all of those male uh, children, such a terrible uh, massacre. Again, it shows that Satan is real and active, that he could stir up Herod to do that. And it's important to remember that Satan is active today. Satan uh, not only hates the fact that Jesus came, but he hates the fact that Jesus is still preached today. Uh, Satan hates the work of organizations like Answers in Genesis because it is promoting the gospel and promoting salvation. And uh, we must remember Satan is active today. Isn't it interesting how people follow horoscopes today? When I was in the newspaper shop this morning, I looked at several newspapers and magazines and I was surprised how many newspapers have these horoscopes, the signs of the zodiac. Uh, how many people take these things seriously? It's and th this is the work of Satan uh, deceiving people. And I think one of the reasons we have horoscopes is that Satan does not want people to think of the star of Bethlehem. He wants them to think of other false star signs. Uh, Satan doesn't want us to think of the birth of Jesus. Have you heard uh, of this plan for instead of people talking of BC, AD, before Christ, uh, there's this move to have before the common era and after the common era, BCE, ACE. Again, Satan doesn't want people to think of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may have also noticed more of the media are speaking of the festive season, not the Christmas season. Again, Satan doesn't want people to be thinking of the reality of that first uh, Christmas and what it really meant, a saviour coming into the world to save 
lost sinners. Satan does all he can to turn uh, Christmas into a material activity um, and something which doesn't relate to the true uh, Christian message. And following on from that, uh, Matthew 2, that account of the Star of Bethlehem also shows how rebellious human nature is. Uh, isn't it really terrible how Herod uh, said to those wise men, go and search diligently when you have found him. Bring word to me that I may come and worship him. Of course, Herod had no intention of worshipping uh, the Lord Jesus. You see how deceitful uh, he was. And as I said already, the chief priests and scribes, uh, they should have been so uh, motivated to go to Bethlehem and yet they weren't their priority was to be loyal to Herod and in, in, these are examples of showing how rebellious is human nature and the account also shows us how human nature is so blind uh, to God we read of that principle in 2 Corinthians uh, where we read whose minds the God of this age is blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And uh, not only at the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus do you see that blindness, but today we see the same blindness. People today are searching uh, in the wrong place for answers. There are astronomers who listen to messages from space uh, using radio telescopes and uh, listening to the radio waves that travel from galaxies as if they're going as if they think there's going to be a message from aliens and uh, there are people who send out messages into space they even put phonographs onto spacecraft going out into uh, outer space and yet the answers are before our very eyes in the bible god has given us his revelation his testimony, and we only need to open that book to see answers. We won't get answers by, by listening to, to messages from space. Which leads on to our biggest need. Uh, we live in a world today with uh, many problems and, and worries about the climate, about uh, the coronavirus, and yet man's biggest need is to seek God. This is one of the first uh, generations for, for a very long time that no longer calls on God. If you go back to the Second World War and you listen to broadcasts in, uh, in the United Kingdom and, and in the United States, lead politicians, prime ministers would call on God uh, for help in times of trouble. But we now live in an age where God is not called upon. And from an individual point of view as well, our biggest need is to seek God. And this is where there's a very important lesson from the wise men, because the wise men, they put their priority into seeking God. They went through an epic journey. Sometimes finding God is not is not simple. Sometimes it takes a long time. It, it takes a, it takes a big effort. For some people, it can be dramatic and quick but for others it can take time and it, it took time for the wise men uh, it wasn't just a, a long journey it was a dangerous journey in those times but they were prepared to make that journey to seek the kingdom of God the most important journey we can make in life is to seek God's kingdom it was a costly journey for the wise men and it can be a costly journey for us uh, and one of the things that strikes me most from that whole account is the bold witness of those wise men. They were so bold when they spoke to Herod. And that's a lesson for us. We should be bold in our witness, telling others that the king has come. King Jesus has come into this world. There is joy in finding the saviour. What a lovely lesson this is. And there is that lovely verse in, in verse 10 
When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. It's a wonderful expression, isn't it? Uh, the most joyful thing in the world is to find faith and salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, because we were designed to have a relationship with God. Uh, if we don't know God, then we don't know the purpose of living. The whole purpose of being on this world is to know and worship the creator. And there's also that joy of having the hope of eternal life in heaven. This world is full of problems, but in heaven, there are no tears, there's no death, no disease. It's a wonderful thing to be able to look forward to eternity in heaven. And so not surprisingly, there is just incredible joy in finding a savior. At Christmas, it can be very pleasant having a good meal. Um, I'm, uh, I do very little cooking at home, but I, one of the meals I do volunteer for is a Christmas meal, and I try and make that meal as lovely as possible for my family, and it's, it's good to enjoy that. But pleasures like eating and receiving presents, they're just fleeting pleasures. There's no other joy like the joy of knowing salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that if you repent of your sins, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, believe that Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. You don't have to earn salvation. You just have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can save you from your sins. And that is what gives you uh, can give you great joy. Another lesson from this account is that Jesus is king. It's important to remember that Jesus is not just a savior, he's also king. And it comes out so clearly in the gospel of Matthew. And he wasn't just king when, <clears throat> when he was an adult, he was king from the day he was born. And uh, we, we read that in this particular section. When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense and myrrh. It's thought there's a significance to those three gifts. The gold uh, relating to his royalty, his kingship, frankincense to his priesthood and myrrh to his suffering because he would suffer on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins. What a great sacrifice uh, that was. So there seems to be a significance in the contents of those three gifts. And th this is an important lesson because if you do become a Christian, uh, not only do you know Jesus as your saviour, but you should know him as your Lord and your king. There should be that kingship over your life. It's important to know the authority of God's word. It's important to know the authority of uh, the kingship of the Lord Jesus as well. And finally, uh, to encourage you, uh, Jesus is the light of the world. There's one uh, Christmas carol that says star of wonder, star of light, star of royal beauty, bright. What a beautiful sign the star of Bethlehem was. What an appropriate sign. It was appropriate because Jesus came from heaven. He came from heaven to earth. In John we read light came into the world and the light shone in the darkness. So how appropriate that uh, the sign of the birth of Jesus would be that star sign in heaven. Jesus is also the king of glory and uh, a king of glory, a light is very appropriate as a sign for that. Jesus is also the bright and morning star we read in Revelation. Uh, the, the planet Venus, when you see it in the morning and the evening, it's on its own. Even though there are countless stars in the night sky, sometimes you see one star on its own, uh, the planet Venus. And that reminds us of the Lord Jesus, who alone is worthy of glory and honour 
and it's the only savior and the and the most uh, important one uh, that, that that we should recognize and of course jesus is the light of the world and so what an appropriate uh, star sign the star of bethlehem is and there's that wonderful promise in john 8 that if we follow jesus we will never walk in darkness uh, sadly, we live in a very dark world with dark forces and bad things happening uh, and people being led astray constantly. Um, and yet, if we know the Lord Jesus as our saviour, there is that wonderful promise. We will never walk in darkness. We have the light of God's word and we have the light of the Lord Jesus shining in our lives and the help of the Holy Spirit. So this Christmas, let us be encouraged by this account and also let us be encouraged to witness boldly like those wise men did all those years ago. Let us witness boldly to the King of glory, uh, to the light of the world. Well, I hope you found that encouraging. Um, as I said earlier, I have written that book, The Star of Bethlehem. I've written other books uh, as well. Um, if you're interested in other aspects uh, of work I've done, you can check out my website, profstuartburgess.com. Uh, uh, this year, I've been working at Cambridge University on a fellowship uh, looking at using engineering to model and understand biological systems. And I report on my work on that. On that website, I also give a, a commentary and review of programs like Life on Earth by David Attenborough and give some comments and critiques on that. And th there's various other things on that website, uh, my work for the British Olympic cycling team and my work for ESA as well. So you're welcome to check that out. But thanks very much for joining us uh, this evening. I hope you're encouraged uh, by that. So I just stop uh, sharing my screen there. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. That was a really uh, encouraging talk. I can see many of the comments um, that have come through and a lot of people have greatly benefited from this. If you do have a question, and um, we'll try and get some of those to Stuart really quickly. But I wanted to ask Stuart, first of all, um, you did mention the sort of a cultural understanding of Christmas about the wise men, how many wise men they were. How did you come to, I mean, what brought you to believe in in the talk that you've just presented was it was it something that you've just come across or is it was it years ago that you realized actually what the bible was saying how did you get to digging deep into the text um i think as i said at the beginning uh you know since being a christian i working for the european space agency i i often wondered was the star of bethlehem a supernatural star or a natural phenomenon that question kept coming up so that's what started me uh, on this whole process of researching into it. And like many accounts in the Bible, once you start looking at the details, you realize that so much comes from the text and you get, can get so many lessons from the text. It seems like a simple story, but so much can come from it. And uh, some, some one of the questions that has come through, a, 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 a typical one, when do you believe Jesus was born? Was he born in December? As, as we often obviously we celebrate his birth on the 25th of December. But does the Bible say anything or give us any details about what month he could have been born in? Um, I don't have strong views on that. Um, calendar systems through history can be reasonably accurate. Uh, so I think it almost certainly was the winter time. Um, but it's quite possible that we don't know the exact uh, date. So I certainly wouldn't be dogmatic on the 25th of uh, December. Yeah. I don't know if you have any other views on that. No, my, mine are a bit like yours. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was the 25th of December. It could have been maybe as early as September, October. But um, these, again, it's hard to, to put it all together because there's not probably enough sufficient details in the text but i think the main point is that we recognize and celebrate um, the birth of our lord jesus as you were saying um someone did ask a question they wanted to know whether you believe the star could have been 
an angel. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, okay. This is something I didn't really go into in the talk. It's really quite hard to know what the light would have been. It, it could have been an angel of light. Uh, it could have been a real kind of ball of fire or a real a real star that appeared and then was taken away. So it could have been either of those things. From the text, it's not possible really to draw any firm conclusion. So the answer I would give is that it could have been um, a real physical light or it could have been uh, an, an angel. There's also the related question of physically where it would have been, how high up in the atmosphere. And again, we can't, it's very hard to, to speculate on that, but it, it may not have been a long distance away as other stars are. It could have been quite low in the atmosphere. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, Liz Williams has asked, did other people see the star if it was over Israel for one to two years? Do you think other people saw it as well? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I've, I've often thought about that. Um, we can't be dogmatic. My own feeling is that other people may well have seen that star. Uh, but as I was saying in the talk, because of the blindness of man, you know, people wouldn't have been thinking too much about it or would have thought it was signifying something insignificant. Uh, so other people could well have seen it, but it may not have been visible for one of two years because what may, the, the way I see this, again, you can't be dogmatic, but the way I see this is that the wise men would have seen it for a brief time when they were in Babylonia uh, in the east. Then it, the star would have disappeared. They would have gone to Jerusalem and then the star appeared. So there may have been a very big gap between when they first saw it and when it reappeared. So we, that's another unknown. We don't know for how long the star was appearing. But for the time that it did appear, I can well imagine that other people saw it, but just because of their blindness, didn't see the significance of it. Yeah. And of, of course, because you believe it was a supernatural star, um, obviously it's no longer with us today. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was another question, Stuart. Um, someone asked, how do you think the wise men or the Magi um, got back to a return to Babylon after the angel warned them in a dream? Yeah, they obviously avoided Jerusalem and, and Herod. Um, they, I mean, apart from avoiding Jerusalem, they may have gone back a similar way to the way that they came. And it would have been a long journey going back, uh, which emphasizes the amount of preparation that they would have had to have gone through. It wasn't just getting to Israel, but it was getting back as well. Uh, so it, it was a really remarkable journey that they went through. Yeah, I think I can. I'm looking at all the questions that have come through. I think we've gone or covered most of them. A lot of them are very uh, similar. But I would say to everyone, thank you for for tuning in tonight, for watching this presentation. If if you want to get Stuart's book, it is available at Answers in Genesis in the UK. I'm not sure if it's available in the US. If you're watching from the US, so you might have to order it from the UK store if you if you want to get Stuart's book The Star of Bethlehem and um, but it is there in the in the links in, in the comment sections I think that's been put in there um so if you want to take a look at that or any other books Stuart has written then please do go to our web store but with that I'm going to um thank you all for watching it's been a really great and excellent presentation I'm sure we've all learned something and it's just a reminder to us as well um as Stuart was saying you know, when we celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus, we want to share that joy of the light of the world coming in into the world to save sinners. And so make sure you express that to people in your family, your friends, your work colleagues um, this Christmas. So, Stuart, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Simon. And again, thank you, everyone, for watching. And um, hopefully we'll be back with you in the new year. God bless.